All right, 30 seconds will start. Don't know where Muhammad is. Muhammad's never not here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so let's get started. Um, so we're going to take a – today's a little weird because we're actually going to look at the presidents. And we're actually going to look at the end of Reconstruction, which may seem a little weird because we just started Reconstruction. But you're going to realize that a lot of the problems from the Reconstruction era happen actually after the Reconstruction era. And uh, this will make a little more sense as we go on. But um, I think before we do that, I think we should look at the presidents. Um, there were technically a total of four, if you count Abraham Lincoln for six days. Uh, but there really is, uh, we're going to look at three. Um, the first of which we've already kind of talked about. The second of which we kind of maybe remember already from some of the things from this class. Okay. And the third of which you guys haven't probably heard of yet. Okay, so who were the presidents during Reconstruction and what were they known for? Well, let's first look at the first president uh, that takes over after Abraham Lincoln is Andrew Johnson. Um, in terms of what you need to know for the regents, it's really nothing other than he's known for being impeached. He's the first president impeached. Now that, if you forget, is a check and a balance that the legislative branch can do on the executive branch if they believe that the um, president is committing a high crime or misdemeanor. Um, and in this case, uh, Andrew Johnson, who already wasn't very liked, um, does something a little bit um, not so good. He ends up firing um, a radical Republican from, uh, from the government. And uh, a lot of people think that's something he's not allowed to do. He's overstepping his boundaries and his power as the executive leader. Uh, we've already seen that he's had problems with Congress um, between the Freedmen's Bureau and overriding the veto and uh, a couple of other things. So he is known for being impeached. Uh, he was charged with misconduct as president. Now, when it went to the impeachment vote, um, so there's two things that happen. When you get impeached, you go on trial. And then once you go on trial, there's a vote to basically find out if you're guilty. 
And the people that vote are people in the um, Senate. And you needed two thirds of the vote in the Senate to get him fired. And um, he almost did. He, there was a difference of one vote. So he almost got impeached and taken out of office. Now, there's been four presidents that have ever been impeached. Um, excuse me, three presidents. Um, Andrew Johnson, uh, Bill Clinton's the second, and then uh, Donald Trump's the third. Both in the cases of Bill Clinton and Donald Trump, they both really weren't close to being taken out of office, um, really at all. The fourth one, Richard Nixon, who we'll learn about, was going to be impeached, but he ended up resigning before he could be impeached. All right, so Andrew Johnson's the first president. Uh, he was impeached. He was almost fired as president. We already know that he didn't get along so well with a lot of people in the country because he was from the South at the time. He didn't get along with the radical Republicans. He's known as being a really weak leader. Um, but he did, you know, with the radical Republicans, he did put the federal troops in the South to help control them better. Uh, we do know that was more of the radical Republicans. But um, from there, I want to go back to the questions from yesterday. All right. Um, I think Madison wasn't here, so I'm going to rely on Jacqueline, Mia, and um, Jessica to try and answer the questions from yesterday. This is a review from yesterday's lesson. Um, why don't you put in the chat what you think this correct answer is when you're ready. The radical Republicans in Congress opposed President Abraham Lincoln's plan for Reconstruction because Lincoln's plan did what? So this is more of a question on Lincoln's plan and why uh, the radical Republicans opposed it. Two is correct, yes. It rejected the idea of harsh punishments for the South where the radical Republicans wanted to punish the South for what they did. Okay, remember the radical Republicans were more like extreme Abraham Lincolns. This one's a little harder. I'm gonna read four speakers, two of which would have been the attitudes of a radical Republican. So speaker A, secession from the Union caused this war and those who support of it must now be punished. Speaker B, the nation's wounds must, will heal most quickly if we forgive the Southerners and welcome them back into the Union. Speaker C, the freed African Americans must be given economic assistance and guaranteed the constitutional right to protect themselves. Speaker D, the war may have ended, but the fight must continue to preserve the system of white supremacy and the KKK in the South. All right, which one of these two speakers would be more of a radical Republican? Take your time, which two speakers would be a radical Republican? Yes, also two, Jacqueline, very good, A and C. Okay, those, those would be the viewpoints of a radical Republican. Speaker B would most likely be Abraham Lincoln. Speaker D would most likely be a Confederate person. Okay, excellent. All right, so let's go to Ulysses S. Grant now. Now, um, we've seen Ulysses Grant already in this class. Okay, not too long ago, that was a couple of weeks ago. We saw Ulysses S. Grant. He was the major Civil War general for the Union. Okay. He was very well liked, specifically by, by the black voters. Remember, during Radical Reconstruction, while the Radical Republicans were put in office, okay, while they were there, a lot of African Americans were able to vote. Okay, there's a span of about six to seven years where black people were voting pretty much without a problem. So he's going to be elected and he's going to be the first president elected um, with the black vote supporting him. Okay, now I'm fairly certain he would have won without the black vote, but it was very clear that a lot of the black voters, the new black voters, uh, wanted Ulysses Grant to become president because he was the former um, Civil War general and obviously was very well liked um, in the Republican Party. Um, he did a lot of great things. You're going to notice that specifically when it came to Reconstruction, uh, he was very good about helping out African Americans. He was very good about um, making sure the South was behaving. The problem with Ulysses Grant and his presidency was, you know, understand, remember, presidents have tough jobs. They have a lot of different things they could do. So as good as Ulysses S. Grant was uh, trying to help out the African Americans and trying to push forward Reconstruction, he really wasn't good in terms of um, leading the country in the economy. The economy went on to a huge uh, slump, okay, almost like a recession. It was called the Panic of 1873. You don't need to write this down. I'm just mentioning it. And his administration and even Ulysses Grant was a little bit corrupt. 
So they're acting dishonestly for a gain in power or money. A lot of his people in government took bribes. And um, Ulysses Grant had the opportunity to run for a third term, but he did not. Okay, so that sets up the very controversial but very pivotal election of 1876. Okay, and we're going to look at that uh, election of 1876. You guys have one more slide, which we're going to copy down shortly. All right, so I'll give everyone another 30 seconds to finish copying this, and then we got to go on to the next slide. Okay, here we go. So please copy this down. I'll talk to you guys in a minute. Um, first look at the election of 1876, okay, which if you remember, it's okay if you don't, it's one of those elections that were really close where the winner of the popular vote did not win the Electoral College. Uh, 1824, 1876, so this is one of these elections, 1888, 19, um, 2000, and 2016, those are the five. Okay, so this is one of those five, okay, where those elections happen. So we'll talk about this in a minute once you guys are done copying. Okay, so let's look at the election of 1876. We have two candidates here. Um, now, at this point, the Republicans have pretty much... Um, how do I put this? The Republicans are going to nominate a person named Rutherford B. Hayes, um, and the Je Democrats are going to nominate a person named Samuel Tilden. Um, I believe Samuel Tilden was the governor of New York at the time, so he was a pretty popular person. But a lot of the people from the South got behind Samuel Tilden, and many people believe that he was the best person to um, run the country. Okay, so you're going to have a very close election. All right, so the Democrats, who are largely based in the South, okay, get went into this situation where both Samuel Tilden and Rutherford B. Hayes fought for in a very close election. Very similar to what you're experiencing kind of with Trump and Biden, there was a lot of very, very close states. And since there was a lot of close states, this is going to lead to basically um, a deadlock in the um, certification of states on who's going to actually win the election. So when the people voted, a lot of the votes were very close. However, the final tally basically gave Rutherford B. Hayes um, the presidency. Okay, said he won enough electoral votes, though it was very close. All right, Samuel Tilden had won more of the popular vote. So we have a lot of controversy. Now, it was so controversial, some people believe that we maybe get, uh, get ready to have a, another civil war. Okay, so people needed to figure out what to do and to fix the situation immediately. All right, and what they came up with was a compromise to both make the South and the Democrats and the North and the Republicans health, um, happy, excuse me. All right, so this compromise is kind of the reason why 
reconstruction is going to take a huge turn. Okay. So reconstruction only lasts from 1865 to 1877. And the reason is because of this compromise, and I'll explain how. The compromise is this. The South will accept, okay, and not secede again, basically. They will, they will accept Rutherford B. Hayes as the president of the United States to become our 19th president of the United States if in exchange Rutherford B. Hayes removes all of the federal troops and lawmakers in the South that were protecting the rights of African Americans. The South doesn't want to be babysat anymore, basically. And the South comes up with this compromise, and they agree upon allowing Rutherford B. Hayes to become the president if the federal troops in the South leave. This election for Rutherford B. Hayes signifies the end of Reconstruction because the government leaves the South alone, and now there starts to be other things that the country is more worried about at this point. Okay, But please remember this. The troops in the South were the ones keeping the South behaved. Okay, They were the ones making sure African Americans were getting their freedom. They were making sure that the South weren't passing laws that were going to be uh, hurtful okay, towards Reconstruction or hurtful towards the African Americans. Now that the troops are gone, the South starts to misbehave, and what I like to say is known as reverse Reconstruction. Okay, because what you'll learn on Thursday Friday and Monday are all the things that happen after the Southern troops leave. And this is where some of the not so good things start to happen for African Americans throughout this time. All right. So even though Reconstruction era is technically over, the effects of the Compromise of 1877 will lead to a lot of the problems that many African Americans are going to face over the next. 50 to 75 years. Okay. So, you know, you see this uh, post here, it says fraud of the century. Okay. Many people believe that this was a not so good moment in American history because we, you know, you exchange a president, Rutherford B. Hayes, didn't really do too much. He wasn't a very great president by any means. And then in exchange, you get the South to uh, have the federal troops, they leave the South, and this becomes. A huge, huge problem. All right. So how are we going to do this? Well, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to watch Brain Pop. And the first half of the Brain Pop is going to be review. And the second half of the Brain Pop is going to be kind of like foreshadowing and some things you're going to learn on uh, Thursday, Friday, and Monday. Okay. So some things are going to be new. There's going to be a little bit of a preview. Some things are kind of uh, old. Okay. So we'll go through kind of each one. Um so let's start this video. I'll explain a couple things as the video goes on in a second. Wow, it took me forever to realize you're not the speaker. What? You do not look alike. Dear Tim and Moby, what happened after the Civil War? Did the Union and Confederacy become friends again? From Xavier. Um, not exactly. The South had surrendered, but that didn't mean that they'd changed their minds. They still disagreed with the North about the role of the federal government and African Americans' place in society. If anything, years of brutal fighting had only deepened these divisions. To make matters worse, the South was in ruins. Its cities were destroyed, and its former slaves were now homeless and jobless. The nation turned to Abraham Lincoln to direct Reconstruction, the process of rebuilding. After all, he had just steered the ship of state through its greatest crisis. What? N no, it's just a figure of speech. Anyway, Lincoln's leadership through the war had just won him a landslide re-election. So even though politicians bickered over how to rebuild the nation, they lined up behind the popular president. Hey, what happened to my ship of state? A station wagon of state? <sighs> all right. Lincoln's top priority was reunifying the states as quickly as possible. So he offered amnesty, an official pardon, to civilians who supported abolition and swore an oath to the Constitution. For freedmen, liberated slaves... Okay, yeah, so obviously this is the review stuff, but I want you to take note of how they use the station wagon, the car, as a metaphor. 
for how the United States is going to be under certain presidents. So when Abraham Lincoln's the president, you know, everything's kind of under control, everything's fine. Once other people take over, like Andrew Johnson, like Ulysses Grant, the car isn't as in control as you're about to see. All right, so these are some of the last things Lincoln does. We saw his um, goal for amnesty. Now we're looking at the Freedmen's Bureau. This is all review. Slaves, Lincoln offered jobs and free schooling. His Freedmen's Bureau also distributed food, clothing, and medicine to all needy Southerners. Lincoln's instinct for compromise seemed to be winning the peace. When he was assassinated, the country lost its most moderate voice. Lincoln's vice president, Andrew Johnson, was a former slave owner from Tennessee. As president, he stood by while Southern leaders passed black codes, severely limiting the rights of freedmen. They needed special permits to travel or work anywhere besides a farm. Without a job, they could be fined and forced to work to pay it off. Yeah, it seems pretty close to slavery because it more or less was. The Union didn't fight a grueling war just to let the Confederacy get back to business as usual. Riding a wave of northern anger, a small group of congressmen took over Reconstruction. These radical Republicans nullified black codes by passing the 14th Amendment. It guaranteed all the rights of American citizenship to freedmen. Congress also took control of southern state legislatures. They installed hand-picked officials to draft laws protecting freedmen. To enforce these laws, they stationed Union soldiers across the South. The radicals' hard line translated to real changes on the ground. Literacy rose as African Americans took advantage of free schooling. Hundreds won seats in state assemblies, and 16 were elected to Congress. Well, laws alone couldn't unify the country. The South still had completely different social values. Many white people found it hard to accept former slaves as their equals. The most hateful formed a terrorist group called the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK attacked and killed political leaders and other prominent African Americans. Not all Southerners supported those tactics. But even moderates in the South saw Reconstruction officials as a threat. They called them carpetbaggers, mocking them as opportunists out for a quick buck. And anyone who supported their programs was a scalawag, a sneaky troublemaker. Tension boiled over when the president removed a radical Republican from his cabinet. Congress impeached Johnson, accusing him of breaking the law. He managed to stay in office, but wasn't nominated to run again. His successor, Union General Ulysses S. Grant, finally brought some calm to Washington. Working with Congress, President Grant used Union troops to fight the KKK. Within a few years, all of the Confederate states accepted the 14th Amendment and rejoined the Union. But life in the South still wasn't much different than before the war. Well, jobs were tough to come by for freedmen. Most had to share crop on the same plantations they'd worked as slaves. They would borrow a piece of land, borrow the supplies to farm it, and hope the harvest would pay back the owners. They rarely grew enough to repay the loans, and many went into debt. Yeah, it was like a new form of economic slavery. Meanwhile, the nation grew weary of the Reconstruction Project. An economic slump shifted attention away from the plight of poor Southerners, and Grant was plagued by scandals and accusations of corruption. Reconstruction ended abruptly with the presidential election of 1876. Voting results were too close to call in several southern states. The rival camps settled the dispute with the Compromise of 1877. The Republican candidate, Rutherford B. Hayes, was handed the presidency. In exchange, all troops and officials were removed from the South. Within months, politicians with Confederate values returned to power in state legislatures. To cement their control, they passed laws designed to prevent African Americans from voting. Okay, so all the stuff they're going to mention here, we're going to learn over the next couple of days. But you saw once the troops leave, this is where some not so good stuff happens, okay, for African Americans specifically, okay? And this is when the radical Republicans leave. Poll taxes set a fee for voting that many freedmen couldn't afford. And literacy tests meant that only the educated were allowed to vote. 
These Jim Crow laws also set up separate public facilities for African Americans. No, they weren't equal in quality at all. The forced division of races, or segregation, became an accepted practice in the South. Generations of African Americans endured life under this system, even as many of them tried to change it. It took until the 1960s for these laws to finally be struck down. Even today, we're still dealing with the legacy of slavery in America. We have a ways to go, but we are slowly getting better. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, so you're seeing how, you know, those are you, some of the topics we learned, but you also have some new topics that we're going to uh, kind of go through. But you'll see how the reversing reconstruction aspect after the Compromise of 1877 is going to lead to some not so good things, specifically for African Americans. So we'll kind of look through that. Um, there's a very good chance you're going to finish this early today. Um, but if you go to today's assignment, um, if you go to the Google Classroom, that is, if you go to today's assignment, Okay, you will notice um, a reading with four questions. Uh, please do the four questions um, on a separate Google Doc and attach the Google Doc for credit for today's assignment. Or you can write them in your notebook and take a photo of it and post it here as well. Either are fine. All right, but I don't think this will take you longer than five, six minutes. Um, if you do finish early and you owe me some work, maybe go work on that for the rest of the period. But otherwise, if you're all caught up with your work, all you got to do is... Um, Finish this and turn this in. Please keep in mind, tomorrow you have your 10th uh, and final uh, textbook Thursday for 2020. Uh, so please make sure that is uh, completed as well. All right? So that's it for this period. Um, I will be here, obviously, if you can, need some help with the questions. But I think after the reading, it should be pretty straightforward. I don't think you have much of a problem. All right? So, yeah. Let me know if you have any questions.